message. Political messages about how, how men perceive women, that need to be expressed. I mean, we could, we could silence them. We could tell people that they can't use certain rap lyrics that women find offensive and thereby shut the discussion down. But however offensive it is, I think the cruder it is, to some extent, the more we have to step up and defend it. So I was a little surprised that you didn't. Well, I think, I, think uh, I start with we're all responsible for the culture. We have a very degraded popular culture now. Mm -hmm. And much of the degradation has to do with songs about uh, torturing uh, women and chopping up cops. And I don't think this is a healthy thing to have. Now, I don't want any censorship, but I think the society, if you believe in society and you want to clean it up, you should fight for it. You should call these people to account. You should use every message short of uh, censorship, which I don't believe in, to say this is not the kind of stuff we want our kids to be uh, raised on. Do you think the firing of IMUS amounted to censorship, or was that the No, it's not censorship. Work? Censorship is something the state That does. the government does. Yeah. And here's where we might disagree. I think free speech values have to be lived in the community. If we don't live them in the community, it may, the courts may not enforce it. I think these are values that we have to live. I, I, I don't know that an employer should fire someone for saying something because the public demands it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, well, you, it gets back to your issue about there's the marketplace, you know, the, the, the place in which all this should be decided. And I think the marketplace was, in fact, what decided this, uh, this particular case. Well, and maybe, I mean, maybe and my, my point that, is maybe it shouldn't be left to the marketplace. All right, yes, let, su suppose, suppose a pedophile wanted to come on campus. And what he wanted to say was that he thought, he wasn't going to advocate the breaking of any laws, but he just wanted to come on campus to say that he thought it was a good thing for adult men to have sex with underage girls. This is his point of view. He wants to represent that point of view. Should we let him speak? Sure. On the college campus. I think there's a cutoff place <coughs> between high school and college. There are certain things I would allow on college campuses and not on high school. Depends on the maturity of the student. Mm -hmm. But sure, on a college campus, you should be able to advocate anything. Anything? You, all right. Uh, there are certain websites now that promote the joys of anorexia and bulimia. They, I think they actually give people instructions on how to do that well. Doing that well, I assume, means death. Um, the, this is a matter of life and death. These are people who are exercising their rights of free speech in a way that will kill young women particularly. Mm -hmm. Should these websites be allowed to stay on the internet? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you have to allow that kind of free speech on the internet and and on the college campuses. Mm -hmm. um, this situation is a little different with with uh, using uh, hateful terms on radio and then having them all endorsed by famous politicians and journalists who show up to say this is okay with us, you know. Uh, in which case, you get a kind of uh, effect that nothing matters. That. Uh, that if the, most, if the next president of the United States is willing to go along with uh, uh, some of the hateful terminology that uh, I misuse, it's okay with us. Well, it's not okay with me. I withdraw my support. I'm not going to listen to him. I'm going to urge other people not to listen to him. That's what happened. I think, I think there's one drawback to that argument, and that, and that is that the people that do listen to it sometimes wreak havoc on others who don't listen to it. So you can't just you know, claim that for example, that uh, violent video games that may, may completely uh, pervert the mind of somebody who then turns around and walks into a, a public high school and murders five or six people. Um, you know, that, and I think that there have been some you know, cause and effect uh, number of studies that have been shown that this indeed can happen. And so I, I'm very troubled, though, with that. You, know, it, it's a, you, you can't just shut these things off. It's impossible well, to shut them off. You're, they, they, you're bombarded by it. If right. you're not bombarded mm -hmm. by it directly, then somebody else is who may then have some impact on it. The, the trouble with, with censorship is that you can, you can take a sticky issue like the violent video games and come down on either side. <clears throat> Excuse me. But if you do, if you come down and say, well, it's, it's worthwhile censoring these games, the next thing you know, you're going to be censoring Macbeth because it's filled with bloody stuff. And Hamlet, you know, where does it stop? Yeah, there's a slippery slope um, here. Yeah. You can't do that. You have to always give the close ones to free mm -hmm. speech, I think. And I think also there's collateral. See, the thing, the, the problem I have with what happened with IMUS, there's collateral damage. There's a chilling effect. People may think more carefully now about saying anything that's controversial. So it's not just IMUS. It's the effect that this episode has had on other people who speak controversially about issues that they may now have to second guess whether I can say that or whether I'm going to be fired, which is where I think the damage was. How about this show? I want to ask you this. Men's Net. No, no, seriously, this is something that's been on my mind. 
Men's mm. net, this table where we're sitting right now is arguably the only place in the United States of America where people can come to talk about gender issues from a man's perspective. There are dozens or maybe hundreds of other shows that deal with relationships and gender from a woman's rights point of view or from a woman's point of view. This is it for us. This table right here is all we have. Now, you could make the argument, it seems to me, that because this is such a limited resource that we should close it, that we should just put men on, just people with a men's rights point of view. Tony, to his credit, hasn't done that. Mm -hmm. He's invited women on. He's invited feminists to come on. But I wonder whether, or, I mean, that's a question. When you have a very limited resource, do we have an obligation at this table, when this is the only place we have to present our point of view, to invite opposing points of view? What do you think? I guess you do, but I think the broader question is uh, why uh, aren't panels like this uh, more common in the media? Why is it that the media establishment doesn't really want to discuss what you call men's issues? They're, they're just nowhere. You're right. They're, they're not on the screen. And if you bring them up in private conversation, people will start to laugh because it's the oppressor is mm -hmm. complaining. Uh, at least that's the point of view. Mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't get any support for this kind of discussion. Well, I was on a radio show the other day. I just, I just addressed the issue of the reintroduction of the Equal Rights Amendment, and the female co-host said, you must hate women. I mean, you cannot have dignified conversations about these issues in the mainstream media. But you do think that even here uh, on Men's Net, this one little oasis for us, we should be inviting contrary points of view. That's what if you're in favor of open discussion, you have to practice it too. I think also it, sharpen, it sharpens our point of view. I'm very, very much uh, uh, an advocate of, of debate as a, as a means of sharpening your point of view and becoming much, much more confident in what you're really standing for. Yeah. So I, I definitely think Tony, I agree Tony is on the right track. I think Tony's on the right track exactly this too, right. To uh, you had mentioned to me, Steve, that, that you think that the, what the campus officials are doing uh, is kind of uh, an unlawful. They know that this doesn't pass constitutional muster, but they do it yeah, anyway. Kind of a, and I uh, wonder whether the behavior of the campus officials that kind of flies in the face of the First Amendment encourages a kind of lawlessness and disrespect for free speech. Would you agree with that? I agree. I think that, that you cannot be the president of a major or even a minor university now unless you take sides and the side they take is really a pro-censorship side. Their constituency, the donors, the alumni so far, and the, certainly the faculty doesn't want to hear certain messages. Okay. Uh, they don't want to hear any challenge of affirm against affirmative action, for instance, that you get suppressed. We have, we, have, we have 30 seconds left. I just wanted to give John okay, a chance right. to talk about what's, what are you doing at the Manhattan Institute? Because we have a little seconds. of everything. I'm, I'm uh, writing for the City Journal, mm -hmm. which uh, specializes in long uh, analytical pieces. And I'm doing some freelance work, and I'm working on a book. Okay. Uh, we are out of time, and so uh, I appreciate. I think this is an important discussion. I hope Tony will come back to it because if we can't talk freely about these issues, then obviously nothing will ever happen to change anything. Uh, I want to thank our guest, John Leo, senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute. It's been a pleasure having thank you here. Thank you. Thank you. Been fun. Steve Metzger, uh, men's Thank rights you. advocate extraordinaire. Thank you, Steve. And thank you, Tony, for letting me be a part of this. And thank you for watching Men's Net and for supporting this program. We'll see you next time. Thank you.